Y'all brought a Bible this morning? Praise God. I am in Genesis chapter 39. We're dealing with the life of Joseph in these studies. And you know, I want to continue along those lines tonight, today. I, uh, I feel like this is an important uh, study. Joseph was such a, a type of Christ and a picture of an overcomer, what we have to be, overcomers. Overcoming through the ups and downs of life, the twists and turns on the highway of life. Uh, overcoming through trials, tribulations, troubles. Overcoming through the hard times. But let me tell you another real peril. Overcoming through the good times. The times of success and prosperity. Because let me tell you, sometimes that's when the devil ambushes you. When you think you're on the top of the mountain. Well, you know, when you're on the top, you're a target. <laughs> from the entire perimeter. So today, I want to deal with the subject of Potiphar's wife. I call today's message of Potiphar's wife, a dreamer's nightmare. Because <laughs> you know Joseph was called the dreamer, right? He's Joseph. Here comes that dreamer, his brother said. He's the dreamer. Well, she's a dreamer's nightmare. <laughs> Genesis 39, chap, I mean, chapter 39, verse 1. And Joseph was brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him of the hands of the Ishmaelites, which had brought him down there. And the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man. That is, he, he succeeded. The Lord blessed him. He was in the house of his master, the Egyptian and his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. It was evident God was blessing Joseph. And Joseph found grace in his sight and he served him and he made him overseer over his house and over all that he had he put into his hand. And it came to pass from the time that he had made him overseer in his house and over all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was upon all that he had in the house and in the field. <coughs> and he left all that he had in Joseph's hand, and he knew not aught he had except the bread which he did eat. And Joseph was a goodly person and well favored. And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph, and she said, Lie with me. But he refused and said unto his master's wife, Behold, my master, what if not what is with me in the house, and he has committed all that he has to my hand. There is none greater in this house than I, neither hath he kept back anything from me but thee. Because thou art his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? And it came to pass as she spake to Joseph day by day that he hearkened not unto her to lie by her or to be with her. And it came to pass about this time that Joseph went into the house to do his business and there was none of the men of the house there within. And she caught him by his garment saying, lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled and got him out. It's the second time he lost a garment. Didn't end well either time. <laughs> and he got him out. I like the way that he got out of there quick. And it came to pass when she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and was fled forth that she called unto the men of her house and spake unto them, saying, See, he's brought this, he's brought in a Hebrew unto us to mock us. He came in unto me to lie with me, and I cried with a loud voice. And it came to pass when he heard that I lifted up my voice and cried, that he left his garment with me and fled and got him out. And she laid up his garment by her until her husband came home. And she spoke unto him according to these words, saying, That Hebrew servant that you brought unto us, I mean, she's going to blame the husband. He came in to me to mock me, and he came to pass. I lifted up my voice and cried that he left his garment with me and fled out. 
And it came to pass when his master heard the words of his wife, which she spoke unto him, saying, After this man did thy servant unto me, that his wrath was kindled. And Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, a place where the king's prisoners were bound. And he was there in the prison. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners that were in the prison. And whatsoever they did there, he was the doer of it. The keeper of the prison looked not to anything that was under his hand because the Lord was with him. And that which he did, the Lord made to prosper. So he went from the ruler of Potiphar's house to the manager of the prison house. You know, the Bible says many, many wonderful things about a virtuous woman or a godly wife. Uh, the Bible says a, a virtuous woman who can find her price is far above rubies. That is her worth, her value, far above rubies. Uh, a godly wife, and that's what's implied there, a godly wife is more valuable. Than, it's pri- she's priceless. You can't right. buy something so valuable as a godly wife. Uh, A virtuous woman, what it means is a woman of good character. Well, that's not what Potiphar's wife was. She's the opposite. Think of a good woman and then think of the opposite. That's Potiphar's wife. (laughs) The Bible says, Whoso findeth a wife findeth a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. Proverbs 18.22. But implied there is that whoso findeth a good wife Find with a good again, good meaning of good character. Because you know why a good wife will do you good all of her days. That's what the Bible teaches. Potiphar didn't find a good wife. He found a nightmare. And uh, unfortunately, there are too many nightmares out there, both men and women, by the way, both men and women. But whatever you think would be the qualities of a good and godly husband or a good and godly wife. Potiphar's wife, she's the polar opposite. We don't even know her name. Uh, the Bible doesn't give us her name, doesn't tell, tell us how old she is, uh, what she looked like. There are some traditions that uh, say that she was probably a little older than Joseph, and there are some traditions that say she was a good-looking woman. Uh, What we do know is that she was a lustful, bored, rich woman who was used to getting her way. Uh, And uh, we know that she was selfish, self-indulgent, lustful. And once she set her eyes on Joseph, she made him her quest. She's married to an important man, Potiphar, a very important man. And that gave her a great deal of importance as well. Uh, That meant that people admired her, but it also meant people would fear her. Uh, We do know that Egypt was an extremely immoral society, uh, and we do know that she would have no scruples with uh, lying with another man, somebody who was not her husband. This is a woman used to getting what she wants, used to having her way. And uh, you know what's a, a bad combination Bored, rich, immoral woman who uh, is just left to marinate in her own lusts. And uh, then you bring in a young, good-looking, well-built Hebrew slave and let him walk around the house all day. It could be a bad combination. (laughs) And in this case... uh, it certainly was a bad combination. Now, 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 look with me to verse 6, chapter 39, verse 6. The Bible says something here about Joseph. It doesn't say this very much about very many people. The end of verse 6 says, And Joseph was a goodly person and well-favored. It means he was good-looking. He was very handsome. He, had, uh, he was a nice-looking man. The Bible doesn't use that language very much. Just a few times, mostly because in in the eyes of God, beauty is inner. It's an inner quality. It's a quality of the heart, a quality of the spirit. 
You know what's precious in the eyes of the Lord? A meek and quiet spirit. And what's, what's uh, in the eyes of God, great beauty or, or in a man would be his character, his, his morality. But it does speak here in this way of Joseph. Now, only a couple of other places does the Bible speak of men in this way. It speaks that way of David. David was a good-looking man. First, Corinth, uh, First Samuel chapter 16 speaks of him being a, a really good-looking young man. Um, the Bible says this of Absalom. Uh, it also says this of a few women in the Bible. And guess who it said it of? It says Genesis 29. It says this of Joseph's mother, Rachel. That she was a good-looking woman. So we know where Joseph got his good looks from. You know, oh, yeah. Didn't come from his dad. <laughs> Came from his mama. That's where beauty usually comes from anyway. You know, but uh, he got it from his mother. So here's this good-looking man and a lustful woman. And, and that's a recipe for disaster. Everything is going so well for Joseph. I mean, you know, after everything he went through, getting sold by his brothers, betrayed, sold as a slave, now he's in Potiphar's house and things are going well. In fact, they're going so well that Potiphar made him his manager and put everything in his hands. Potiphar said, if something's wrong, fix it. I don't even want to know about it. You run my house. You run my finances. You run everything. Don't even bother me. Just... Make sure that I have good food to eat at night when I get home. Now, that's somebody you can trust to run your entire affairs. Well, that's what Potiphar did with Joseph. Potiphar trusted him entirely. The Bible tells us the Lord was with him and the Lord prospered him. And Potiphar's house thrived under Joseph's leadership. But, but I mentioned something earlier. I want to mention it again. You know, sometimes it's when you are really doing well that we become the most susceptible to the devil's temptations Amen. and lures. In the midst of success, sometimes, is when the devil's temptations come the hardest and the strongest. And I think that it might be because in the midst of success, we tend to become spiritually complacent. There's something about success when things are going well, I don't know if it's that, you know, that subtle enemy pride that wants to build up in our hearts because, you know, that Adamic part of our humanity just wants to creep back up uh, and none of us are immune from the thoughts of pride or self-accomplishment or self-congratulations. Uh, we think we're doing well. The tendency is in... A, a time when things are going well, the tendency is to rest a little bit on our laurels, become a little spiritually complacent, and that's when we sometimes become the most susceptible. I want you to think about this. David is called a man after God's own heart. David, the sweet psalmist of Israel. David, the prophet. David, who wrote so many of the Psalms. David, who walked so closely with God. David, who fell so hard and so far. Here's a question. When did David fall? Did he fall when he was in the midst of all of these terrible trials, when King Saul was chasing him through the desert when he was having to hide in the woods or hide in caves and didn't know where his next meal was going to come from. He didn't know who was going to betray him. When life was hard, when things were difficult, is that when David fell? No. Not at all. Because, you know, in all of the hardship and difficulty and trial and affliction, he spoke to God. He worshipped God. God gave him psalms. Right? Amen. But you know when David fell? After he became successful, after he became king, after he had won many, many battles, and now he was enjoying the fruits of his success. Now 
He's taking his ease. He's sending his armies out to fight at the times when kings went to war. And David is just chilling, standing on his roof and looking at things he ought not be looking at. His eyes wandered. And, and, and you know, if, if our eyes wander and we let them linger, the heart can follow and the feet will follow. And the next thing you know, David has fallen into this temptation, uh, the allure of a beautiful young woman. And now David, the man after God's own heart, has, has terribly backslidden. It came at the peak of his successes. He was, this is not when David was down and out. It was when he was successful. He was doing so well. Well, what about King Solomon? I want you to think about him, the man who collected women like some men collect stamps. Uh, Solomon did not fall into these temptations and sins when he was young. No, when he was young, he was just another of the king's sons. Uh, You know, not really very distinguished from any of the others, to be honest. But after he became king, and now he's the most powerful man in the empire. And now people jump to do his bidding as he presides over an empire so vast that uh, it, it, was, it surpassed his father's empire. It was then, in the peak of his success, that the temptation struck. Solomon, you can have any woman you want. Any woman you want. You are king. And you know, there are things in the human heart that you don't think the devil, you don't think sometimes the devil can reach in there and, and touch. But let me tell you, we are clay. Yeah. We are men. We are women. We are flesh. We are human. And none of us are immune. Let any man that thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Don't get puffed up in, in yourself or in your strength. But... Learn at all times, Lord Jesus, I need you to be my shield, my fortress, my buckler. Because we are weak. The temptation to fall can come at any age. It can come to the young. We know the young are susceptible to many, many kinds of temptations. The Bible tells them, flee from youthful lusts. Because there are lusts that particularly appeal to the very young. Uh, There are lusts that appeal to, uh, you know, people of all ages and sizes and and so forth. Uh, There are temptations to bite the bait, no matter how young or how old you are. I was uh, talking to Gordon about this not long ago. He caught a big old redfish. a couple of weeks ago, 15-pound redfish, and I'm thinking that's an old fish. I have heard that these old fish can live to be 30, 35 years old. Can you imagine that? Some of these big old 30-pound, 40-pound redfish. But, you know, they lived all that, all that time, and then in their old age, they fall for something stupid like a little piece of plastic bait. I mean, how they live so long, get so big, and then in their old age, they fall for some pink little bait. Don't even look like anything normal. Fall for it. See, in your old age, you can still fall. (laughs) And temptation to do stupid things can can come at any time. I had a laugh at this fellow. He was admitting what happened to him. He said he was in traffic. He's singing. He's praising the Lord. Some knucklehead pulls out in front of him, hits their brakes. He almost slammed it to the back of them. And on the back of the guy's bumper is a bumper sticker that says, if it feels good, do it. And he, he said immediately what came to my mind, what would feel good right now is to smash into the back of his car and then jump out and punch him in the nose. And if he said, what did you do that for? I'd say, because your bumper sticker told me to. It felt good, and it feels good to do that. (laughs) You know, sometimes these sudden anger. Isn't it something how anger can flash? It comes out of nowhere. 
And all of a sudden, you're in a rage. You know that is the flesh, right? <laughs> uh, uh, not long ago, I was reading about the uh, what was left of Heritage USA. I don't know if y'all go back, uh, think back to the 1980s, uh, the PTL club, Jim and Tammy Baker. You know, I don't know if any of you, any of you ever went to Heritage USA when it was in its heyday? No, we didn't either, but <laughs> saw pictures of it. Do you know that Jim and Tammy Baker presided over an empire that made $10 million a month? $10 million a month. Actually, it made a little more than that, a little more than $10 million a month. They bought 2,300 acres of land in South Carolina, and they developed a theme park bigger than Disneyland. Bigger than Disneyland. Everything Disneyland had just, they had it. They had 500-room hotel. They had amphitheaters, every kind of ride you can imagine. They had their big Heritage USA amphitheater production company train that brought people up. They had Disneyland for Christians. Six million people a year visited their theme park. They had a water park that would embarrass Walt Disney's water park at Heritage USA. In the peak of their success is when he fell. Not when he was a struggling young, trying to make it in the ministry young guy. That's not when he fell. That's not when he stumbled. It was at the peak of their success. Ten million a month is coming in. 2,300 acres, more than Disneyland. And that's when the temptation... You know, when you're up on top, you're a target. And uh, don't think the devil uh, doesn't come after you. Sometimes you think, well, I'm, you know, I'm an older man now, an older woman now. I'm not going to fall for that stupid stupidity or that foolishness. Uh, the, the fact is we just might be the most susceptible when we are the most successful. Uh, here in chapter 39 and verse 7, the lustful Mrs. Potiphar cast her eyes upon Joseph, the Bible says, and she offered herself to him. Come lie with me. Now, he's young. Young men, you know, hormones rage through their bodies. No question in my mind that she knew how to array herself to appear very seductive to him. Uh, he's a man. He's young. Look at verse 8. But he refused. Whew. He refused a woman who was not used to being refused. And in fact, this would have been quite insulting to her. Uh, and look, he told her why. He said to his master's wife, Behold, my master, trust me completely. He trusts me completely. He's committed everything he has, everything he owns to me. There's no one, verse 9, no one greater in this house than I am. He hasn't held back anything from me except you. And then he gives her these two arguments. Number one, I cannot betray the man who trusts me. I cannot do that. And then secondly, he says, I would be sinning against my God. Now, let me tell you, these are two things we need to all keep in mind. When temptation strikes uh, and temptation, it's not a sin you know, if temptation shoots that fiery dart, it's a sin when you let that thought stay there and now you weigh it, you know, hmm, yeah, pros, cons. Uh, we have to keep our minds under the blood, cast down imaginations. I like these two 
these two arguments he gives. I would be betraying the person who trusts me. The man who has committed everything into my hands. I would be betraying him. Amen. Most importantly, I would be betraying God. How about that? Men, listen, we all know that we can, we can recite the names of some of our fellow men who have fallen into temptation. Whether that temptation was an, another woman, whether that temptation was some financial misdeeds or whatever it is, keep, keep very much in mind, we betray, we betray those who love us, those who trust us, those who look to us, rely on us. That could be your spouse. That could be your family. Amen. We betray them. Yep. We betray God. Amen. We betray God. And, 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 of course, ladies, the same thing is true with you. Look at what he calls this in verse 9. How can I do this great? wickedness great wickedness now you know what stands out here is joseph's character Amen. what what godly character Amen. what a man of integrity right here this man had these deep spiritual convictions i will not betray the ones who trust me i will not betray my god and he's living in the middle of of the most wicked place on earth egypt I mean, to this day, we use the word Egypt to relate to the world and all of its wickedness and allures and sinful pleasures. Oh, that, this, this world is Egypt. Right. He lived in the middle of Egypt. And guess what? <coughs> he had no support system in Egypt. It's not like he was attending a church where he was getting, you know, encouraged by his brothers and sisters in the Lord. Uh, Y'all follow me? We have a support system. We've got brothers and sisters in the Lord. If we're, if we're battling something, you can call someone. And, and I guarantee you, you call a brother or sister in this body and no one is going to besmirch you. What they will do is stand with you, pray with you, encourage you, cry with you. Do everything in their power to keep you going in the right direction. Amen. Don't ever be afraid to call a brother or sister if you're going through, you know, a trusted brother or sister in the body of Christ. You call them. You talk to them. They will keep your confidence. They will pray with you. They will stand with you. He's surrounded by immodesty. He's living in Egypt. He's got no support system. And yet he never failed in his convictions. I will not betray the one who trusted me. Let me tell you, that's character. That's integrity. That is an example for us. And can I tell you something else? This was not a one-time temptation. Because look with me in verse 10. It came to pass as she spoke to Joseph day by day that he hearkened not unto her lie by her to be with. Day by day, every day. It's the same thing. And I'm, I'm, sure in each, I'm sure each day she probably made herself a little bit more enticing, a little bit more alluring because, you know, this woman was demon-possessed. She had it in her mind. She was going to bring Joseph into her bed, whatever it took. This woman was on a quest. Every single day he had to deal with this woman. Every day. Can you imagine Every day he, he has to go into his master's house and overcome this woman who's trying to allure him at, at every turn. <clears throat> and, and you know she was shameless. Uh, verse 10 says, He wouldn't listen to her. He hearkened not unto her. To lie with her. He wouldn't follow her. And verse 10 says, or be with her. He had to avoid her. Amen. Imagine that. He's got to do his work there. You know, the boss is gone all day. He's a busy man. He's gone all day. Amen. So Joseph has to keep his eyes and ears open because he knows this woman is after him. So he every day he has to watch that she doesn't get close to him. He's got to escape. 
And he maintained his integrity. And you know what that tells us? It can be done, man. Ladies, men, it can be done. He overcame. We can overcome. No matter how the temptations come, no matter how strong they are, we have no excuse. We can't say, well, you know, she just wore me down. She wore me down. You know, the minute I saw her, she just wore me down. Not many people. I, 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 I'll be honest with you. I, I read passages like this and I, I start thinking of some of the excuses that people bring, you know, why they yielded to this temptation or that one. You, you know what happens? People start to reason. They start to reason things out like, uh, well, everybody does it. Everybody does it. What's so wrong with that? What's the big deal? No big deal. Nobody's going to know. It's just, we're going to do it in secret. And then you could start thinking, well, you know, it might even be to my advantage, you know, to uh, the boss's wife, you know, might get some leverage or something here. Or maybe I'm not supposed to pass up these opportunities when they knock. I had a, a fellow tell me one time, that his daddy told him to never pass up an opportunity to have a woman when that opportunity comes. So after his fifth or sixth marriage, uh, true story, true story, he was still following his father's advice. Uh, what do you think about a father who tells his son something like that? Well, you know, his son listened to his dad. And, uh, and he left a trail of wreckage behind him that follows him to this day. Uh, you know, people think of all kinds of justifications of why they do things. Uh, but you can't even blame it on the devil. You know, he's attempted, but you've got to be the one who listens. Can I read a verse to you? From James 1, blessed is the man who endures temptation. That means you overcome it. For when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to them that love him. Let no one say when he's tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then, when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Well, old Potiphar's wife was not to be denied. So in verse 11 and 12, the spider spun a web. It came to pass about this time... Joseph went to the house to do his business. There was none of the men of the house there within. You know what this woman did? She, she planned and schemed and she made sure there were no other eyes in the house. She got rid of everybody. So that it was just Joseph, no witnesses, and her. Josephus said that this language right here that you know it talks about uh in, in verse 11 about when it talks about it came to pass about this time that there was actually some egyptian religious festival that everybody would attend of course joseph wasn't going to attend because these things are all religious and heathen and all that so he wouldn't attend and she pretended to be sick so that she could go back to the house nobody would be there these schemers huh so she pounced on him, yanked his garment off, and he did what a man of integrity would do, or a woman of integrity. You run. You get the out. <laughs> Hello. You get the out. The Bible says God will give us a way of escape. There has no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, 
who will not allow you to be tempted above you, what you're able, but he will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. 1 Corinthians 10.13 And the way to escape is often get thee out. Run. Fast and fall. <laughs> and then comes the wrath of the woman scorned. Whew. Verse 13, 14, 15, 16. Verse 17, she lied to her husband. She said, this man came in, tried to take advantage of me. You know me, I'm an innocent, frail little thing. I'm so innocent. And this nasty Hebrew man came in here to take advantage of, of my virtue. And you brought this man to our house. But it's your fault. How the tables turn. Huh? So... Her lust for Joseph turned into hatred for Joseph. Now she wanted to destroy him, and she would do anything in her power to do it, uh, just out of spite and desire for revenge. And so Potiphar's wife, he hears these words, and he was angry. I still wonder whether he's angry at her, angry at him. Uh, it doesn't say that's correct, but the fact that he put him in jail and didn't cut off his head tells me he probably didn't really believe his wife. And you know, he was around his wife a lot and he was around Joseph a lot. And uh, when it comes down to who am I going to believe? And yet at the same time, he's a very important man. His wife's an important woman. He can't ignore her accusations. The servants are all now... Uh, you know, she spilled all of this to them. He has to take some action. He's got to do something. So, Joseph goes to jail. Joseph's reward for doing the right thing. You know, sometimes you do the right thing, and the Lord, I mean, it's just evident the Lord blesses you for doing the right thing. But don't think it's always that way. Because sometimes you do the right thing and you suffer for it. Hello? Look, you might ask yourself, I mean, Joseph could have been asking himself, he could be sitting in a prison saying, God, how can you let this happen to me? I've maintained my integrity. I refused my boss's wife. I did the right thing. I did the right thing. And as a result of doing the right thing, I've lost everything, and now I'm in jail. I've lost everything because I did the right thing, because I was honest, because I obeyed God, because I obeyed you, I did the right thing, and now look what I'm going through. I'm going to be honest with you. I believe we suffer from an anemic brand of Christianity that promises people that everything is always going to go well if you just Obey the Lord. If you're a Christian, it's going to be good. Everything's going to work out good. Sometimes things go bad. But not forever. You may suffer for your right deeds, but it'll only be temporary. I mean, even if it costs you your life, that's still only temporary. The rewards, of course, for doing right are eternal. Sometimes, you know, life just isn't fair. And don't be afraid to tell people, you know, why did this happen? Why did that happen? Things just, it doesn't seem like God's fair. Let me tell you something. Life isn't always fair. Bad things do happen to good people. Sometimes good people do good things, they do the right thing, and they suffer for it. While the wicked prosper. You know, that's what the Bible tells us. <laughs> Excuse me. He is a man who resisted the temptation to sin, maintained his integrity, and he is his reward. He's in prison. He's all alone. He's lost everything again. We are told in the scriptures repeatedly that we are to live righteously, 
that we ought to serve God and obey God, that we're to be faithful, that we're to resist temptation. We know how we're supposed to live. We know how God wants us to live. But in life, many times Christians suffer for doing the right thing and for living right. But it's only in the short term, and it's never the end of the story. You mind if I read a passage from over in First Peter two? I'm just gonna I'm just gonna turn over there for a minute. First Peter chapter two. Keep your finger here, I'm coming right back. But this is an important passage and I think we should take a minute to read it. If uh, you could turn there with me. Y'all y'all awake? You know, it's almost like this passage was uh was meant to fit right in with what was going on in Joseph's life. First Peter two eighteen servants, slaves, bond slaves. Be subject to your masters with all fear, honor, reverence, not only to the good ones and the gentle ones, but also to the froward. That means those that are unfair. Harsh, unjust, cruel. He says, verse 19, For this is thankworthy. The word means commendable. Actually, the Greek word there is grace. Here's here's where grace comes in. If a man for conscience towards God endures grief, suffering wrongfully, If you do the right thing like Joseph did and you suffer unjustly for it, and and that's for doing right. If you suffer for doing right, here's what the Bible says, verse 19. This is commendable. This is thankworthy. The Greek word charis. This is grace. Here's the idea. If you do right and you suffer for it, God accepts that. It's actually pleasing to the Lord. In the fact that you overcome. Y'all awake? Because you know why? This is how the Christ life is demonstrated. This is how you take up the cross. You know, we talk about the cross. We sing about the cross. But here's how you take up the cross. You do right and you suffer for it. That's exactly what the Lord went through. In that sense, he says, verse 19, if a man for conscience towards God endures grief, suffering wrongfully, for what glory is it when you be buffeted for your faults? If you do wrong and suffer for it, you just get what you deserve. I mean, what good is if you take that? Well, I'm taking that. I'm just, I'm going to endure this suffering. Well, you, you, you deserve it. Look at what you did. But if you do well and suffer for it and you take that patiently, that is, you overcome it, This is acceptable with God. Or as the English revised, this pleases God. If you suffer for doing right. Verse 21. For even here unto were you called. For Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow in his steps. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled, that is, abused, cursed, provoked, he did not return that abuse. He reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judges righteously. This pleases God. Now, When we suffer for doing the right thing, this is what the Bible says, this is grace. Let me tell you how Thea defines that. Thea's Greek lexicon. This is acceptable with God. You see that in verse 20? That which God is pleased by. That which pleases God. When God's disciple, when Christ's disciple suffers for doing right and does not defend himself or herself, does not vindicate himself or herself, 
does not fight back when you just take the wrong and commit yourself to God, then the Bible says you are walking in your Savior's footsteps and you win his approval. That is, you win his blessing. Verse 20, this is acceptable with God. This pleases God. Williams translates verse 20 this way. If you do right and patiently suffer for it, it is pleasing in the sight of God. Or Beck translates it, but if you suffer for doing good and take it patiently, God is pleased with you. That's what the Lord did. That's how he responded to wrong, to accusations, to slander, to abuse. Uh, you know, they, he did right. They, he suffered wrong for it. And now we're called to follow in his footsteps. But you know what? We're Americans. We don't like those footsteps. We're determined to defend ourselves. We're determined to vindicate ourselves. We're determined if they do something to us, we give it right back to them. Can I tell you, according to the scripture, that is not Christ-like. That is not the cross. That is not following the Lord's example. You all awake, right? I hate that kind of preaching, Brother Rusty. Well, I don't like it either. Because I have to die too. We all have to die. We all have to overcome. Verse 21, verse 22, verse 23. When he was reviled, he did not answer back. Whew. How about Isaiah 53 and verse 7? He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb. So he openeth not his mouth. All the accusations are coming against the Lord. He didn't answer them. The lies, the false charges, he didn't answer them. Can I tell you something? I believe that Joseph did exactly this. That he did not answer the charge. You know, Potiphar's wife is hurling some charges at him. We don't read where, where Joseph responded to those charges. We don't read anything about his response. I tend to believe that it's because he didn't respond. And perhaps had he responded, he might have been executed. Because no slave can start slinging accusations against the master's wife, the master of the house's wife. He, I'm convinced he was silent. That's not an easy thing to do. Charges are flying, especially a charge of immorality coming from an important person. He could have said a whole lot. Boy, he could have called her a lot of names. He could have vindicated himself in the eyes of his master. He could have set the record straight and he probably would have lost his head in the process. He still wound up in jail, but... In jail, he was not executed. And in jail, I mean, we read how the Lord blessed him in the jail. You do right. You may suffer for it, but only in the short term. The Lord will bless you. The Lord will bless you. Look, if in the short term you suffer, so be it. You know, sometimes people who are honest, they can, they can suffer for it. I know, you know, Marion and some of the others in the real estate business. I have a daughter in the real estate business. And my daughter tells me sometimes how people will, uh, a real estate agent that really doesn't have a whole lot of integrity will, you know, they, uh, they'll tell a, a prospective home seller, like, you want to sell your house. So you're going to interview a few agents. You know, who's going to sell my house? And if they don't have a whole lot of integrity, they'll tell you, you know, your house that's worth $100,000, they will say, I can get you $200,000 for this house. Just list it with me. Now, they're lying through their teeth. They know they can't sell that house for that price. 
And the honest one that says, look, the market value on your house is about 100000 and yours is not quite up to the standard of the market, so, you know, I think we should price it a little under a hundred, and you'll sell it. Well, now, who are you going to list with? The one who's, sm- who's selling you pie in the sky, I'm going to get you 200000 for you, or the one who's being honest. You know, sometimes the honest one suffers. They'll pass the honest one up and go with the pie in the sky. That's just one example about how people can, uh, can be unscrupulous. The honest person can actually suffer for it. Y'all still awake, right? Yeah. Well, I'm in uh, Genesis 39. And here's what the Bible says. Verse 21. But the Lord was with Joseph. You know, these are bookends right here. Because verse 2, if you look back to verse 2, the Lord was with Joseph. He gets sold into Potiphar's house. The Lord was with him. He was a godly man, a man of integrity, a man who was going to do the right thing, a man who was going to trust the Lord. The Lord was with him. The Lord blessed him. Now he's thrown in jail. But the Lord was with Joseph. You know, the Lord never leaves us or forsakes us, right? These, uh, these bookends, the Lord being with Joseph... It really uh, encourages, it should encourage us that, you know, the Lord's with us too. No matter what our trial, trouble, tribulation, difficulty, the Lord's with us. Be a man, be a woman of integrity. Be a man, be a woman of honor. I read something, this was in yesterday's, uh, a little devotional reading I do from uh, Spurgeon. Yesterday's devotional reading, I thought it was, it applied to today's message. Um, it's from Psalms 31, where the psalmist uh, says, I will take heed to my ways, Psalms 39, 1. I will take heed to my ways that I send out with my mouth. But the idea is, I will guard myself. That's what the psalmist is saying. I will guard myself. You know, that's something we all have to do, beloved. We have to guard ourselves. We have to guard our eyes. We have to guard our ears. We have to guard our hearts. We have to guard our words. I will guard myself. It's a wise thing, you know, to be on guard because temptations are all around us. Like Joseph, we live in Egypt. We live in a very sensual, uh, vile world full of temptation, always trying to pull you away from the straight and narrow. Sometimes we don't have uh, uh, all the support we we would like to have, uh, but you have the Lord. And therefore, we are without excuse. You have the Lord. He's with you. He's in you. He's for you. You have the Holy Ghost. You have the Scriptures. I mean, (laughs) what excuse can we offer? Listen to Spurgeon. Here's what he said. Fellow pilgrim, do not say in your heart, I will go here and there, and I will not sin. For you are never so out of danger of sinning as to boast of security. The the road is very muddy. It will be hard to pick your path so as not to soil your garments. This is a dirty world, and you will need to stay alert. If you are to keep your hands clean, there is a robber at every turn of the road to rob you of your jewels. There is a temptation in every mercy. There is a snare in every joy. And if you ever reach heaven, it will be a miracle of divine grace to be ascribed entirely to your father's power. Be on your guard. When a man carries fireworks in his hand, he should be careful that he does not go near a candle. And you too must take care that you do not succumb to temptation. Even your everyday activities are sharp-edged tools. You must mind how you handle them. There is nothing in this world to foster a Christian's piety, but everything to destroy it. 
How concerned you should be to look up to God that he may keep you. Your prayer should be, hold me up and I will be safe. Having prayed, you must also watch, guarding every thought, word, and action with holy jealousy. Do not expose yourselves unnecessarily. But if called to exposure, if you are called to go where the darts are flying, never venture forth without your shield. For if once the devil finds you without your armor, he will rejoice that his hour of triumph has come. I thought those were good words from old Spurgeon. We live in a dirty world, but you know we have all that we need to overcome and to keep our garments unsullied. Old Joseph, what an example he set for us. What an example. And we can see how he is a type of Christ overcoming the temptations, dying to the self, not letting the flesh rise up to defend or vindicate or so forth, just trusting in the God that he knew, maintaining character, maintaining integrity. Let me close with Jude 24, which says, Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling, and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty and dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. 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 Brothers, sisters, let us follow uh, these godly examples of our Lord. You say, well, he was God, so we know he could overcome. Well, Joseph wasn't God. He was just a man like you and me, a man without many of the benefits that we have, and yet he overcame. So it leaves us without excuse. Father, I pray today that we learn from such lessons as this. Help us, Lord, to be overcomers. Lord, I pray that we be so jealous of your name, Lord, that we do right even if it causes us to suffer for it. Lord, I pray for this body. I pray for me and for all of us, Lord. Help us to, to be men and women of character, men and women of integrity, men and women of the word, men and women of prayer, men and women of faith, men and women willing to suffer if necessary for the cause of Christ. Lord Jesus, deliver us all from an easy believism and ground us deeply, I pray, in your word. I pray for every man here, Lord. Lord, you know that we are but flesh. Keep us, Lord. Preserve us, Lord. Help us to guard our hearts, our minds, our eyes, our ears, our words. I pray for every woman here, Lord every wife, every daughter, every one of your servants, Lord. Let them be women of integrity, women of your word, women who, who, Lord, drink of the well of eternal life. Let them be eternity-minded. Lord, guard their hearts. Lord, we know you speak in the Scriptures about silly women. Lord, deliver these women from from that worldly silliness of being intoxicated by worldly things, Lord. Lord Jesus, let them be godly women, sober women, holy women, women who guard their hearts, women who guard their spirits, women who guard their words, women, Lord Jesus, who guard their eyes, their ears, their spirits. And let us all, Lord Jesus, honor and glorify you in all things, in our speech, in our thoughts, in our behavior. And Lord, we look confidently to you because, Lord, we know that it's in you that we can do all things. We look to you, the one who can keep us all from falling and to present us faultless, Lord, in that day before your throne. And it's to you, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen, amen. Amen. Praise God.